Thank you so much, Patrice. Guild of Club Chicago provides social and emotional support for anyone impacted by cancer, including men, women, teens, and kids. Guild of Club Chicago opened its red doors on Wells Street in Chicago in February 1998. Guild of Club was started in memory of Gilda Radner by her husband, Jean Wilder, and her psychotherapist, Joanna Ball. We offer support groups, educational lectures, healthy lifestyle workshops, social connections, along with resources and referrals. Gilda's Club Chicago is so grateful for our partnership with Advocate Christ Medical Center, and we want to thank Susan and Patrice for inviting us to be a part of the 15th annual Paint the Town Pink tonight. Gilda's Club Chicago has a clubhouse that's located on the ground floor of the outpatient pavilion at Advocate Christ Medical Center. We currently are offering all of our signature programs virtually via Zoom right now, but we look forward to offering our, our programs in person again soon. Patrice Stevens and I facilitate our monthly breast cancer networking group via Zoom right now, and that's on the third Wednesday of every month. If you're currently in treatment or a survivor of breast cancer, we would love to see you at our next meeting on Wednesday, November 18th at 6 p.m. I just want to thank Ashley Carrasco, the Director of Virtual Programs at Gilda's Club Chicago for helping pull off this event tonight. She is behind the scenes, but you've seen her, so give her a wave. Um, and then just a reminder tonight, once our speakers get underway, if you could please just submit any questions that you might have throughout their, their presentation, if you can submit those via the chat feature, Susan will be reading those aloud and the questions will be answered at the end of each presentation. So I will hand that over to Susan now. Thank you, Lindsay. I'd like to formally uh, recognize Dr. Treitman. We are very, very fortunate to have him uh, speak to you today. He is our Section Chief Division of Infectious Disease and Medical Director of Infection Prevention and Control at Advocate Christ Medical Center. He is Clinical Associate Professor at the University of Illinois at Chicago and Advocate Medical Group Infectious Diseases Physician Advisor. He has a huge role and has been playing a huge part in, um, in maintaining COVID at our medical center. He graduated from Michigan State University for his undergraduate degree in physiology in 1993. He attended Wayne State University afterward in Detroit, Michigan and graduated in 1995. And he completed his uh, doctorate in medicine from Tel Aviv University in 1999. He has multiple awards, uh, serves on multiple committees, has numerous publications and has provided all of us with many presentations on COVID and infectious disease. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Adam Treitman. Thank you so much. Uh, that was a really nice introduction and thank you so much for the organizers uh, for inviting me today. Let me share my screen so we can see the slides. All right. So um, we're going to talk today uh, about COVID-19. Um, so this began uh, really in January and February of this past year and, and, uh, and, and as we're all aware has really progressed quite a bit um, in the past 10 months. Um, so in general, we'll, we'll, we'll back up, we'll talk a little bit about coronaviruses. So these are a large family of viruses and, and they cause a variety of illnesses. They've been around a while, they cause really the seasonal or common cold. Um, uh, they are usually seasonal, uh, fall and winter time. Um, and, and the four coronaviruses that are listed there are, were, were the ones that we used to see year after year after year and it really wasn't something that um, was really too applicable to the hospital setting because they, they tended to cause pretty mild illnesses, but those strains of coronaviruses are not the COVID-19 strain um, that we've been dealing with. 
Um, now, all of these coronaviruses, they're enveloped viruses, they're positive RNA viruses, and they're named because they have this solar corona-like shape or crown shape. You can see there's a photo of an electron micrograph, and you can see these little um, spikes coming out, and those are the crowns um, or coronas. So they're the second most prevalent cause of the common cold. They replicate at lower temperatures, um, and they have this predilection for the upper respiratory tract, and that's why most of these viruses um, tend to be respiratory viruses. They cause um, the sniffles, uh, cough, a little bit of congestion. Um, and control is difficult uh, because of the way that they spread. Um, and unfortunately, there's been new versions of these coronaviruses. Um, there's some of these coronaviruses only infect people. There's some coronaviruses that, that only infect animals. Um, but rarely there's a, a, a strain of a coronavirus that, that has the capability to go from um, animal to human um, and, uh, and new through mutational evolvements, new strains can, can develop um, out of chance. And, uh, and that's what we've seen most recently with COVID-19. Um, now back in 2003, 2004, there was SARS. That was the, the, the first um, version of really a, a coronavirus that caused much more severe disease. It or originated in China. 26 countries were affected by, by that um, epidemic, um, over 8,000 cases with a high mortality of about 10%. Um, and the host were bats and the intermediate, intermediate host are, are um, the civet cat. I'll touch on this in a moment. Um, the second coronavirus that, that we saw was called the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome or MERS, or MERS-CoV, um, and this was, uh, that began in 2012, um, and actually still exists to this day. It doesn't really have a great um, ability to, to be transmitted, so we don't see a lot of these cases, but when we do see a case, um, that it has a very high mortality, um, uh, approaching 35%. Um, and then moving on to SARS-CoV-2, um, which is where, where we, what we've been dealing with since December of 2019, um, it originated in Wuhan, China. Um, most of the world has been affected, 188 countries, and now there's been over 40 million cases uh, documented. The mortality rate, since we're still in the midst of this pandemic, it's hard to really ascertain a, a particular mortality rate, um, but uh, it, it, it varies um, certainly greater than 0.1%, which is the usual uh, flu strains to potentially as high as 2%, but it's probably somewhere in between. Um, the host is bats and the intermediate host is what's called the pangolin. So why, why is the host and the intermediate host important? Well, the host is an animal where this virus can survive um, and, uh, and, and not really affect the animal or the host that it's living in. So the, the bat um, can get infected with these coronaviruses and just live and, fi and it's fine. It has no, no difficulties. It doesn't become ill and, and it can, can live just fine with these viruses. Um, but it doesn't transmit them directly to humans. So you need a, an animal that can then transmit it to humans. And so it's thought that the pangolin or the anteater is the intermediate host for SARS-CoV-2. And these, are being, these were being sold in China illegally, um, uh, especially in some of these wet markets um, because of their scales. It's thought that the scales have medicinal properties. And so humans were handling the, um, the pangolin and they were infected with SARS-CoV-2 and then it jumped to, um, to humans. So this is, um, there's something called re reproductive number. Um, the reproductive number is probably something you guys have heard um, on the news. And, and this really is how transmissible a virus is. And what a reproductive number means is for every person that has the virus, how many people are they gonna get sick? So if one person has the virus, if, if I'm sick with COVID, how many people on average am I going to transmit this virus to? It's thought that the reproductive number for SARS-CoV-2 is around two to 2.2. So it, every individual that has COVID will infect two more. And so you can imagine how this pandemic begins. One person infects two, two infects four, to eight to 16, and all of a sudden um, you have this major epidemic and then uh, once it, it, it goes to multiple countries, a pandemic. Now, some viruses like the seasonal flu, you can see seasonal flu on the bottom left. Um, and you can see the reproductive number is a little bit more than one. So a virus, in order for it to be transmitted, it has to have a reproductive number more than one in order to grow. 
Um, and the, the fatality rate is, is this vertical axis. It's about 0.1%. Um, and then you can see on the far right, if you look at that table, measles. And so measles is highly transmissible. The, the um, reproductive number is around 15. So you can imagine that one person gets sick with measles is gonna infect many individuals. So it's highly transmissible and it has a mortality rate around 0.3 to 0.4%. And then um, you can see uh, in the uh, upper uh, mid portion is SARS, um, again, with a high mortality rate um, and, and the reproductive number as well. So the, these concepts are important just when we talk about the epidemiology um, and really how do these epidemics and pandemics start. So how is it transmitted? Uh, primarily from person to person, close contact, um, usually within six feet, um, through respiratory droplets or small particles. Um, and and uh, recently the CDC changed rather than just large droplets, including the word aerosols, which tends to be these smaller particles that can sometimes even go beyond six feet and have the potential to hang in the air for a period of time. We inhale these particles um, into our nose, mouth, or airways, and that's where then they adhere to the lining of either our, our nose or our mouth or our lungs, and they start to replicate um, and produce more virus until we begin to potentially have symptoms. Um, they can also land on surfaces, and so the contact transmission is possible, but as we've learned throughout this pandemic, it's not the main route of, of getting sick from COVID. Close contact, respiratory droplet, and aerosols are, are by far the predominant way that its virus is transmitted. So the incubation period is the time, if I'm around somebody who's sick, how much time is it gonna take for me to get sick if I am gonna get sick? And this is what's called the incubation period. Um, and it's anywhere between two days to 14 days after I've been in contact with someone who's been sick. Now the median or most people will start to get sick around the fifth or sixth day. So we, we, that the incubation period is one aspect and then once you get sick, we say that's your first day of symptoms and we start counting again. So that's what's called the incubation period. There's another term called quarantine. And so these, we'll get into isolation also, but quarantine is meant for people that are exposed. So if I'm exposed to somebody who's sick, now I need to stay away from others. I'm not sick yet, so I'm not isolating. I'm, I'm gonna go in quarantine so I don't infect others. And you go in quarantine for that full period of incubation, which is that 14 days, because I can get sick at any point during that 14 days and I don't wanna transmit it to anyone during that period. Now, once I'm sick, there, the, the, the clock changes again. So if I have a mild to moderate illness, which is defined as, as either I have no pneumonia or mild pneumonia, which is about 80% of cases of COVID, I'm going to be infectious for about 10 days. If I get critically ill and I end up in the hospital, which is about 15 to 20% of the individuals that get COVID, the period that you're infectious is, is up to 20 days. So it's a little bit longer, you shed virus longer, and you have the potential to get, get people sick for a longer period of time. So we'll talk a little bit here about epidemiology. Now there's been over 40 million cases of COVID throughout the world um, and it it's continues to grow, really starts to grow at a logarithmic scale. Once you reach a million, then to get to two million is gonna be faster, to get to three million is going to be even faster. And that's now what we're seeing, this really rapid logarithmic um, replication of the virus as one person gets too sick, as four, eight, 16, you really start to, to churn these numbers quite, quite quickly. Um, so U.S., we've got um, uh, uh, over 8 million cases now documented in the United States. Um, and now in Illinois, um, uh, if you look at this far left table, you can see the number of tests. So in the beginning of the, of the pandemic, Locally here in, in Chicago and in the Illinois area, testing was challenging. We didn't have a lot of testing available. And you can see how the testing numbers were really low and the testing numbers have ramped up um, uh, over time. And unfortunately, if you look at this red table, you can, these are the number of new cases. And so that peak that we hit in early May, um, it's not quite as representative as you would expect. And that's mostly because we weren't testing that much at that time. But unfortunately, you can see the summertime, it started to creep up, now we were testing a lot more, and then at the very end here in October, 
what we're seeing is, is a jump in the number of cases, which is a little bit concerning as we're heading into the winter months. Now, hospitalizations on the next table remains low, but is beginning to creep up. But you get a sense on where we were in May, how high the hospitalization rate was compared to where we are now. We're, we're nowhere near um, that, that period in, in that April to May uh, peak. Uh, but again, it's starting to creep up. And then the death rate is also um, holding steady and starting to creep up just a tad. So how does COVID affect um, cancer? You know, unfortunately, what we saw in March and April, as we shut down, we shut down our hospital too. We didn't allow visitors. Um, everyone was afraid to come um, to the hospital uh, setting. And so this is a study that was, was representative of 20 healthcare systems. And really what, what is, is represented here is, is, um, is the, the sharp decline in visits of, of uh, cancer-related patient encounters, which is quite concerning. Uh, patients with cancer need to go see their doctor. They need to be following closely with their doctor. But the fear during this period was so great that um, those encounters dropped dramatically. And, and this is a, a model that is meant to represent the potential impact that the pandemic has had um, on cancer and cancer-related deaths. Now, this is just a model, but unfortunately, they're predicting up to 10,000 excess deaths because of lack of, 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 of patients with cancer not uh, being able to go see their doctor during that, that period of time with delay of, of diagnoses of cancer and, um, and, and no diagnoses of cancer um, during that period. So what are the symptoms of COVID? I think many of us have heard these, these different symptoms many times. Um, I'll talk a little bit here about COVID-19. I'm gonna talk a little bit later about COVID-19 in comparison to flu. And so it's fever, chills, cough, shortness of breath, fatigue, aches and pains. There's a lot of these flu-like illnesses, congestion, diarrhea, um, new loss of taste or smell is somewhat more specific for COVID-19. And so if you do get COVID-19, it's really important to seek out, um, I, you know, certainly to reach out to your physician right away. But if you're at home and you're having trouble breathing, um, you have a pain in your chest, especially when you breathe, you're confused, your lips are blue, um, or your face has a bluish uh, tint to it, um, uh, or you're not able to stay awake. These are tremendous warning signs, and you should really be going to the hospital right away, uh, calling 911. Uh, so again, just some definitions, um, really just for the purpose of, I think what's difficult, we're, we're hearing a lot of these things on the news, and I think the terms get um, somewhat confusing, but the term infection just means that you're sick with symptoms or you're asymptomatic, but you've had a confirmatory test that shows that you have live viable virus, like a PCR or an antigen test. Um, now, somebody can be asymptomatic and yet be infected, so they're asymptomatic, but they still have the virus, but the virus isn't causing any symptoms. So they, they may be unaware, or they could have been tested and confirmed to be positive. Up to 40 to 50% of patients that have COVID actually are asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic. So they don't have any symptoms and are not aware unless they've been tested, and, but, have, but, but they do have the capability to transmit this infection during this period of time. And then pre-symptomatic is you don't have any symptoms, but you will develop symptoms. So at the moment, you have no symptoms, but you're infected, you're replicating virus and you can transmit virus, but in two or three days, you're gonna to start to develop those symptoms. And then of course, symptomatic is just simply you, you're coughing, you're sneezing, et cetera. So how to wear a mask? I think we all know this, but there's a little bit of COVID fatigue that's setting in with all of us. Um, it's important to wear the mask over your nose and under your chin. If it's underneath your nose, you still can transmit virus, um, through the, through the breathing from your nose and particles will come out, um, if, or if it's not fitting properly, the same thing um, can occur. So masks work. Um, this was an interesting um, a publication by the CDC. Um, and what it did is, is they, they described um, two hairstylists um, that were sick. Now one hairstylist got sick first um, and was working with many of her clients um, uh, and uh, none of the, the clients that, that this hairstylist was working with got sick from COVID. But unfortunately, the, um, the one hairstylist, when they were having lunch with their colleague, they were not wearing a mask and they infected the other hairstylist. 
but while they were um, cutting hair and working with their clients, they wore a mask um, very well. And you can see there were no infected cases um, that were documented. So I think it's a really good example of wearing your mask properly. The hairstylists wore their mask, mask properly as well as all the clients. And although the two hairstylists infected each other, um, none of the, the, the um, clients became infected. And so I'm highlighting here, this is something that we use in our hospital really to kind of remind um, all of our team members about um, when, when we're seeing people get sick. So in the hospital, we see our, our, our colleagues wear masks you know, really carefully when they're taking care of patients. Uh, but we let our guard down when we're having lunch. We're tired, it's hard to wear a mask, and we take our mask off. And if you're too close um, to your colleagues, if you're only a few feet away, now you start talking and you're chatting. And if you're asymptomatically positive and you have no idea, now you can infect um, your friend. So it's really important to stay six feet apart um, uh, at least um, to wear your mask unless you're, of course, eating um, and wash your hands um, uh, as carefully as you can. So this is a cartoon structure of COVID-19. Um, and what you see on the outside, this is called the spike glycoprotein, and on the inside are the components of the virus itself or the genomic RNA. I mentioned before, it's an RNA type virus and it can't live on its own, it needs a host. It needs um, either a human or an animal to, to go into and replicate. Otherwise, it, it's not going to survive. So how do we diagnose COVID? There's, there's different tests. Um, there's tests that are called molecular tests, and these are um, the PCR tests. These are detecting the genetic material. That cartoon we show, that RNA in the middle, that's what it's detecting. The RNA is the genetic material. Um, and we detect it either via nasal or nasal pharyngeal swabs, and they're the most sensitive and most specific test. Um, but once the virus is dead, we may still detect it because the um, remnant RNA is still around, but the virus is no longer living. There's something called antigen tests, and these are beginning to become much more widely available now. If you go to Walgreens or CVS and you need to get a test, they're probably gonna offer you an antigen test. Um, again, it's gonna diagnose acute infection. What's really nice about these is you can get really rapid results. Within 15 to 20 minutes, you can get a result. Instead of it detecting the genetic material, it's detecting the proteins on the outside of that virus in that cartoon that I showed you. Um, it's also from a nasal, either a mid turbinate right in the middle of your nose or a nasal pharyngeal swab, um, and they give the really fast results. Now, they're not as sensitive as the PCRs that we mentioned before, but they're great screening tools. If they're positive and you're sick and you've had an exposure, they're very, very reliable. There's something called a, a positive predictive value of a test, and, and in that setting, they're very reliable. And then there's antibody tests. So antibody tests are there to detect prior infection. So if you were sick a month ago, and you've recovered, and you never got tested before, and you're curious to see if you had it a month ago, your doctor could order an antibody test, and that'll tell us if you had COVID before. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean you're immune. We're still learning whether that is applicable and true or not. So if you do need to get tested, I think this is a great website. The Illinois Department of Public Health has a website that describes all the different COVID testing sites, and that'll include even the corner Walgreens, um, up to uh, the university hospitals that can offer tests. So it, and it's constantly being updated and changed. So a quite useful tool. And certainly call your doctor. I think that's very important to just touch base with your doctor so they're aware that, that you're not feeling well. Now we're, in the, we're about to um, uh, come into the, uh, the flu season. And so there's concerns with, the, with COVID and flu kind of coming together. Uh, people have referred to it as the worry for a, a, a twindemic. So I'm gonna talk about some of the challenges that we have distinguishing flu from COVID. So as physicians, this is challenging. The signs and symptoms are really quite, quite similar. Um, so first, the, the transmission, the, they're pretty similar. Um, respiratory droplets with flu. COVID is gonna be respiratory droplets with this occasional super spreading events or these aerosol, aerosolization. The infectivity is somewhat similar, but COVID is a little bit more contagious. The incubation period for flu is a little bit shorter. It's about two days, uh, as far as the median in COVID I mentioned before, is around five days. Now the dynamics of infectivity, this is actually a, a quite an important point. So with flu, 
most people are infectious when, as soon as they get sick, the early periods of when they're sick, those first few hours to days, they're most infected. With COVID, you're most infective a day or two before you're sick, the first day when you're sick, and then it begins to decline. So that asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic spread is, um, is, is much more prevalent with COVID than, than really other viruses that we've experienced. The risk for disease. So flu, the big risk factor is over the age of 65. And the very, so the very old and the very young is sort of the, the way to think about for seasonal flu. And then there's a lot of different um, health uh, um, uh, morbidities like lung disease and obesity and immune suppression and pregnancy that, that all increase your risk for having complications from flu. With COVID, they're pretty similar. And I, I bold faced a couple of differences. So one is advanced age. So COVID, the, the older that the individual is over the age of 60 and over the age of 70 and over the age of 80, the risk continues to, to grow. Male sex has a higher risk for COVID, diabetes, cancer, and then racial and ethnic minorities have been affected in, in much greater numbers um, than in prior flu epidemics. Now, cancer, having cancer currently increases your risk um, of severe illness from COVID, but a history of cancer, it's unknown if that affects um, uh, the risk for having complications from COVID. So it's an interesting um, way to look at these risk factors really um, with the risk of ending up in the hospital. So if you have asthma, you have a 1.5 times risk of ending up in the hospital, hypertension, three times, you can see obesity is three times. Um, if you have more than one of these conditions, if you have two conditions, your risk is four and a half times greater. And if you have three or more of these conditions, it really starts to increase quite a bit. So the clinical manifestations, flu and COVID, again, it, it's really hard for us to tell them apart. You know, they're, they're both pretty similar flu-like illnesses. COVID does tend to cause a little bit more shortness of breath or difficulty breathing in that subset of, of people, especially the 20% that may end up in the hospital. And new loss of taste or smell is also somewhat more specific for COVID. The dynamics of symptoms are interesting. So flu has this very abrupt onset. Patients often will tell me that they were watching TV in the morning and they remember at 12.30, PM, right in the dot, that suddenly they felt horribly ill and they quickly become, there's a quite a dramatic change over a short period of time. But COVID is, is much different. It fools people. In the beginning, COVID, um, the symptoms are a little bit of stuffiness, a little bit of congestion. Um, most people brush it off and think it's their allergies. And then it gets a little worse and slowly progresses in over around seven to 10 days when those signs or symptoms may get much worse. And then by week two or three is when we tend to see the worst um, symptoms amongst those that will get it. Not everyone's going to go there, but among those that may. The fatality rate for seasonal flu is around 0.1%. And for COVID, I mentioned before, because we're in the midst of the pandemic, it's still too early to know, but it's between 0.25 and 3%. Therapeutic agents, we're still starting to gain some agents. Our management in the hospital now is much better than it was in March and April. Fatality rates are coming down tremendously. We've learned a lot how to take care of patients for COVID. There were many unique features of COVID that were unknown in the beginning, and now our management has improved and, and, and people are doing a lot better um, during this period. So if you get COVID, one of the questions that we had in March and April is, can you have more than one virus at a time? And this study showed um, in Northern California that patients that had COVID, over 20% of them also were co-infected with another virus. So this is a little bit worrisome if you could get COVID and the flu both at the same time. So um, from, the, from, the, from our end and the hospital side, what we're gonna be doing is testing for multiple viruses all at the same time. So instead of doing swab just for COVID, we're gonna do a swab for COVID and flu and respiratory syncytial virus and look for multiple viruses so it informs us because flu we have antiviral therapy for. So we wanna understand um, if, if, if you're in, infected with more than one um, virus. So the, the um, uh, 2020 and 2021 flu season is, is a little bit um, unknown, right? We don't know where we're gonna be, but it's often predicted from the information from the Southern Hemisphere. So this is data 
that's um, collated from Australia, South Africa, and Chile. Um, and if you look at the bottom of this table, you see 2020 on the horizontal axis, and you get into week, you can see 19, 20, 21, 22. That's the that's their um, a flu season. So um, although it's our summer, it's their flu season because it's flipped in the southern hemisphere. And you can see there's almost no cases at all. And they saw almost no influenza in the southern hemisphere. It's thought because they were social distancing and wearing masks and washing their hands and taking all these precautions. And so we hope that we will also see a similar weak flu season, but we have to do everything really well. Everyone's got to get their flu shot and we need to continue to be vigilant um, with, with, the, with the measures that we're doing for COVID. The, this is the flu vaccine, which contains four strains, 2A and 2B um, influenza. Strain is called a quadrivalent vaccine. Um, and the CDC certainly recommends that everyone is vaccinated, usually um, no later than the end of October. So if you haven't had your flu shot, please go get your flu shot. So I'm going to talk a little bit about coronavirus vaccines. I think this has been a um, hot topic. Um, uh, and uh, uh, I think certainly vaccines is, is one of our hopes to help us reduce this pandemic that we're currently in. Um, and so this is um, a, a, um, a way to view the ongoing vaccine. So phase one trials are really early trials. They're just testing a few patients. They're trying to find out safety um, of the vaccines. Phase two trials, you can see there's 14 in the world. These are a little bit later in, in trial where they're starting to look at a combination of safety and efficacy. And phase three trials are those big trials that you're hearing about on the news. So there's 11 large phase three clinical trials going on in the world. Um, here in the United States, we have five major trials that are ongoing. So Moderna, Pfizer, Novavax, um, AstraZeneca, these are all companies that have large phase three clinical trials that are ongoing. Some of them started these as early as August. I think Moderna started theirs in August and Pfizer started theirs in September. Um, and so they're, they're enrolling patients right now and um, they are um, looking at the data over time. So there's a lot of information that's being thrown out on these vaccines. I think so much that it really can make your head spin. So I try to summarize just a couple of key points um, that, that have come up. So August 27th, the, the CDC was instructed um, or began to instruct states to begin preparations for distribution of a vaccine. And so one of the reasons that they began instructing states is the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines need to be um, frozen in minus 80 degrees. So none of our other vaccines are frozen in that kind of way. So they need to begin looking at different um, methods in which they can prepare um, for delivery of a vaccine that may be tough to deliver. September 8th of this year, the CEOs of nine pharmaceutical companies released a joint pledge. And what they said was that they were, they were um, committed to develop and testing potential vaccines in accordance with the most the, the highest of ethical standards and the sound and sound scientific principles, and that they'll only submit um, for emer emergency use authorization once um, the data was um, conducted appropriately. Um, there's been a lot of worry about this because of the politics that have been involved with this. Um, and on September 11th, the FDA commissioner, Dr. Stephen Hahn, tweeted that um, he intended to uh, uh, add additional guidance shortly. Um, and that additional guidance did come out, which was fairly reassuring um, to the medical community. And so on October 6th, the FDA made clear that they wanted two months of safety data from the volunteers that were in these phase three trials following the second dose. So the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines require two doses, three to four weeks apart. And so after that second shot, they want at least two months more time to pass so that, that they could have the appropriate data to see first and most importantly, are these vaccines safe? So they're requesting that before the companies can even submit it to the FDA for potential approval. And they're submitting for what's called an EUA, which is an emergency use also authorization. This is not a full FDA approval um, that many of the other drugs that we um, have, many of the cancer drugs that are, that are being given right now, those go through full FDA approval. 
and October 22nd. Um, so tomorrow, this is going to be important because the Vaccines and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee is going to be meeting in an open session. They're not going to discuss specific vaccines, but they're going to discuss the general principles that they're going to be looking for for these clinical trials. So these are our best scientists and vaccines experts that are going to be getting together to um, form these uh, important principles. Um, but wh why am I talking about this today? Um, and, and why is it so important that the FDA um, is, is fully transparent? It's because recent polls suggest that as few as 50% of US adults are committed to receiving a COVID-19 vaccine. And so we need to be transparent. We need the data. And then once we have the data, then I think the, the US public will gain confidence that this is a safe and effective vaccine, which is gonna be very important um, a vaccine, and if people don't receive it, is useless. So just briefly, this idea of an emergency use auth auth authorization. So first, we have to be um, in, in, a, um, in an emergency. So there is an emergency declaration. Um, the medical pro product has to meet this may be effective. The benefits need to outweigh the potential risks, and there can't be an alternative. So that's why an emergency use auth authorization is being considered for these vaccines because we don't have anything right now. So this was a, a really interesting editorial proposal and really the, the concept of this editorial uh, by a doctor named Howard Bachner in JAMA. And what he talked about was just the importance for transparency, for doctors to feel comfortable that, that they're receiving the data that they feel comfortable to then recommend to their patients. And to this point, we're beginning to receive some assurances from Dr. Hahn, from the FDA, the FDA chairman, that many of these things are, are being taken care of. And, and I mentioned that important meeting that's gonna to occur tomorrow. Now, when we get to the point of um, these vaccine trials being um, furthest, you know, farther along, some of the questions that um, we have in mind are, are, are the vaccines going to be able to prevent people from getting severe disease? Maybe that the vaccine will, um, you, you'll still get mild disease, but you won't get critically ill and end up in the hospital. That would be a, a potential win. Maybe the vaccines will prevent both mild and severe disease. Um, if that's the case, then will these vaccines have the ability to prevent even transmissibility, what we call sterilizing um, immunity, where if you, if you get um, infected, you quickly control the virus, and so I can't transmit it to anybody. So that would be a highly effective vaccine, and that would really um, then reduce the transmissibility. Um, and then if you get a vaccine and it works, well, how long is it going to work for? Is it gonna work for three months, six months, a year? And so these are a lot of questions that I don't have the answers for today, but we have these large phase three clinical trials that are ongoing, and the data is gonna drive where, where we, what, what, what we find out about these vaccines. And so I'll leave you here with this, what's called the COVID-19 Virtual Care Program, which is a partnership with Advocate with the state of Illinois. Um, so if you have signs or symptoms of COVID, you can um, sign up for this number and in the Living Well app, they will be able to, you'll be able to check in every single day and you'll fill out your symptoms and there'll be a clinician if your symptoms begin to worsen There'll be a clinician on the other end of that app that can then reach out to you and contact you um, if, if your symptoms are worsening, um, which can be really a, a nice um, added uh, a benefit in addition to, of course, um, seeking out the help from your primary care physician. So that is it in summary. So thank you so much and uh, certainly welcome uh, any questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Treitman. That was excellent information and very up to date. We greatly appreciate it. I would like everyone to type their questions in the chat and we will relay those to Dr. Treitman. Um, we have a couple questions right now. Uh, we would like to know if there are any particular treatments that are being successful at this point. So, 
there are, um, you know, I think some of the important treatments um, early in the pandemic, we, we didn't understand COVID. And one of the things that COVID does is it, it can cause uh, blood clots. And so in the, if somebody ends up in the hospital, we're very aggressive now with blood thinners. Um, we um, are very quick to supply oxygen. And we also try and not intubate um, or, or put people on mechanical ventilation too early. We found that that wasn't very effective. So the management um, has improved tremendously. Proning patients or turning them um, on their stomach is also really beneficial to oxygenate people's lungs in the hospital. And then as far as um, medications that are now available, there's a medication called remdesivir that has been found to reduce the duration of illness um, in, in uh, clinical trials from 15 days of illness down to 10 days. So it really reduces the signs and symptoms of illness. And then finally, steroids. And steroids at the end of COVID, around the seventh to 10th day, some people that get really sick don't get sick so much because of the virus that's still making them sick. It's because their body's trying to fight it off. And when their body tries to fight it off, there's something called this hyperinflammatory or cytokine storm. And that hyperinflammatory syndrome gets people very, very sick. And so steroids have been shown to be highly effective in, in very large clinical trials and actually reduces death rate very substantially. Um, so that has been one of our greatest benefits once those trials um, became available a couple of months ago. Thank you, Dr. Treitman. Another question. You said potentially 50% of people are willing to get the COVID vaccine. What percentage of United States gets the flu shot? It's around 50%. Yeah, okay. it depends on the year. It's around 40 to 55%. Um, it certainly varies, but um, uh, that's something that we are certainly trying to improve um, in the U.S. There's a lot of concern about vaccines. There's a lot of misinformation about vaccines. So as physicians, we're always trying to educate our patients and trying to give them the truths about vaccines and the potential benefits. And there's always risks involved with anything, but the risks with something like a flu vaccine are extremely small, but the potential, uh, but the potential benefits are great. Because if, if you know, influenza, people get very sick from every year and people die from influenza and the complications of flu. So, uh, you know, physicians are always trying to, to message this um, and, and educate their patients. Thank you. We have another question. Uh, they would like to know what was the medication President Trump received and why did he recover so quickly? So um, it, you know, it's unknown why he recovered so quickly. I, it, many people will get better, right? So 80% of people will get better just on their own. They don't even end up in the hospital. That 20% um, uh, certainly may get better just with um, regular modalities, oxygen and proning and time. Um, now, from what uh, I've read, uh, President Trump received a medication called remdesivir, that antiviral medication. Um, and he also received steroids um, a little bit further in his illness. And what he received that is not yet available is what's called a monoclonal antibody. So plasma is something that was used early in the pandemic and is still available. Plasma from a COVID survivor is taking the antibodies that they recovered from and then we transfuse it into um, somebody who's sick with COVID. So when you get sick with COVID early on in the first four or five days, you're sick but your body's immune system hasn't yet created an antibody to fight it off. So right now in clinical trials are, are these what's called monoclonal antibodies and they're synthetically produced antibodies against the spike protein, that spike, that crown that I showed you that has that spike protein. And the antibodies will bind to the virus and reduce the amount of virus quite rapidly. So that's in clinical trials. Um, and uh, there have been some press releases that these drugs appear to be highly effective when given early, but they're not yet publicate. The, the publications are not yet available um, for us to review the details of it. Uh, but he, the President Trump, did receive um, the Regeneron monoclonal antibody, and so presumably that certainly uh, may have helped him quite a bit. Okay, and how does the medical staff identify those with COVID to be hospitalized? Uh, so what, when somebody, if somebody chooses to come into the hospital, um, in, in the emergency room, you're going to be assessed based on things like your oxygen saturation, 
So if your oxygen saturation is normal, you're comfortable, and your blood work is all comfortable, uh, most of those patients will be sent home. Um, if there's features that are concerning, so if we see that maybe there's some kidney dysfunction, your liver enzymes are elevated, there's some lab abnormalities that are concerning, certainly if your oxygen concentration is low or you're breathing really fast, these are going to be warning signs to us and we're going to want you admitted to the hospital. Um, so there's been a lot of research on vitamin D and uh, how you respond to COVID. What is your take on that? Yeah, there, there has been some evidence to suggest that vitamin D deficiency um, ends up in, in um, higher rates and worsening of COVID disease. But the um, association then with, um, with taking the vitamin D hasn't yet been uh, fully studied. Um, it, it is not thought that vitamin D, once you're sick, a multivitamin or vitamin D probably has no benefit. But if you are vitamin D deficient, deficient um, certainly a multivitamin or taking vitamin D supplements, I think it is a reasonable and a good idea uh, to do because vitamin D deficiency is associated with worsened COVID disease as well as many other viral infections. All right, and last question in the essence of time. Um, you did mention that putting off certain um, screenings and um, going to the doctor is going to have ramifications down the road. So what is your suggestion for people in regards to screenings, in regards to mammograms, uh, going to their doctor, colonoscopies? Is it safe now for people to go in and have these done and would you recommend it? Yeah, that's a great question. It, it is safe and, and it's very important to continue to do um, all of your routine screenings, routine health care. Um, don't put it off. Um, in March and April, it was certainly a different climate. We were dealing with something that was unknown and there was a lot of fear. Um, we now have, uh, we are now managing things in the hospital setting much better. We're all wearing masks and in the early part of the, of the pandemic, we weren't even wearing masks um, in the hospital. And then soon thereafter, we all began to universally mask. So as you come into hospital for an x-ray or a colonoscopy, um, the, all the healthcare providers are gonna be wearing masks. And then you'll have a mask on too, which is really making everything much safer. Um, so definitely don't, don't delay. Thank you very much, Dr. Treitman. Thank we you. greatly appreciate all of your information. And our next speaker is going to be Dr. Smoder. Uh, Dr. Smoder is the lead clinical psychologist in the Trauma Recovery Center from Advocate Christ Medical Center, located on Western Avenue. She received her Bachelor of Arts degree in the field of psychology, um, and it was obtained from Washington College in 2012. She then obtained her Doctorate of Psychology degree from the Chicago School of Professional Psychology in 2018. And very importantly, Dr. Smoter recently completed her certification in trauma-informed yoga. And I don't know how many of you do yoga, but I love yoga. It is a great way to de-stress, to stretch and to just start your day or end your day or get more energy in the middle of the day. So very highly recommended. And I'm sure Dr. Smoter will be able to speak more to the fact of yoga. Great, thank you so much. Um, so like Susan said, I'm Dr. Smoter. I'm with the Advocate Trauma Recovery Center. We are a fully grant funded program that works with survivors of intentional violence. And we provide individual therapy, group therapy, psychiatric medication management services, as well as social services. So we do a lot with the hospital in terms of stress management, resilience building, and those other initiatives as well. So if we could get the slides um, pulled up for this, but while that is happening, because I am having some technology difficulties, I'll tell you guys a little bit about what we'll be talking about tonight. So a big piece of not only the pandemic, but also managing an illness is stress and appropriate stress management has so many benefits. So the objectives for this presentation are to discuss stress, and I wonder actually if I can get control remotely. I don't think so on this team's. Okay. 
So the objectives tonight are to discuss and identify the impact of stress, understand the relationship between the pandemic, cancer diagnosis and treatment and stress response, and describe and identify symptoms of stress and maladaptive coping in ourselves and in others, and also to identify adaptive coping strategies to improve resilience and reduce the negative impact of stress. I always like to start my presentations with a brief mindfulness activity. It helps us just get centered and get our mind in the present moment. So tonight we'll be doing a very brief, slowed breathing. And we're going to practice this controlled breathing to bring a sense of calm and relaxation to our bodies and to our minds. By slowing our breathing, we signal to our brain and to our bodies that we are safe and we can be calm. So if you feel comfortable doing so, Please join me in taking a slow, deep breath in through your nose and exhaling deeply and slowly through your mouth, really making sure that you get that full exhale. Taking just two more deep breaths in through the nose and out through the mouth, focusing on the feeling of the breath entering your lungs and your abdomen, nice and slow. And on this next breath, we'll focus on slowing our breathing for four counts. So we'll inhale for one, two, three, four. Exhale, two, three, four. Inhale, two, three, four. Exhale, two, three, four. And you can hold that Whatever pattern of breathing feels comfortable, just focusing on the relaxation coming to your body, your heart rate slowing down to match your breath, and feeling present in the current moment, fully at peace with your breathing as much as, as is comfortable. You can even visualize inhaling calm and exhaling worry and stress. One more. And we'll finish this together with one more deep breath in for two, three, four, and a slow exhale, two, three, four. So thank you guys for joining me in that. Like I said, I love to start these presentations with a mindfulness activity just to get us in a sense of calm and in the present moment. So talking a little bit about stress response versus toxic stress response and when it starts to be impactful to us um, in a psychological and physiological or physical way. So we all experience responses to stress every single day. In fact, some stress is really beneficial because it helps us to survive. Um, it moderates our stress hormones and other things that our body needs to just do its thing. So there's that continuum from positive or adaptive stress response all the way over to a maladaptive or toxic stress response where there can be a prolonged activation of the stress response symptom in our bodies and increase in cortisol, which has a lot of physical impacts that we'll talk about a little bit later. So an increased presence of stressors in frequency, duration, or intensity can impact individual stress response. So something that we might be handling really well on its own, when other stressors get added, it can push it from that positive to tolerable and maybe even toxic. And the reason why we talk about this is because if we can address the tolerable stress levels, oftentimes we can prevent or prolong them from becoming toxic for too long of a period to have an impact on our physical health. Okay, and then a collective stress response. And you guys don't need to remember any of these terms. I just like to give the background. Um, the collective stress response is the normative responses to an abnormal situation or set of circumstances impacting a large group, community, or global population. And the pandemic is a collective trauma event. We are all impacted in different ways and have many different responses, but we are all impacted and have an increase in stress as a result of the current events and the pandemic. The stress and cancer diagnosis and cancer treatment is a really important thing and why I'm so grateful that organizations like Gilda's Club exist because stress is not always discussed during patient healthcare professional interactions and oftentimes it's not discussed um, 
what their response is when somebody receives a diagnosis. And what we know is that oftentimes after, you know, we get big news like that, we don't hear anything else that comes after. So that stress response can really impact attending to information, next steps in planning, and that initial adjustment, which is really important. Stress management is often an important part of treatment and is linked to more positive patient outcomes and quality of life. So when we feel more keyed up, our quality of life decreases and it also has those physical impacts. There are multiple studies in cancer patients that have examined the effect of meditation and yoga on quality of life, fatigue, and sleep, as well as mindfulness-based stress reduction, which is a guided meditation type program, which has been used as an adjunctive treatment to medical or uh, Western medicine. A program of MBSR reported lower levels of total mood disturbance and distress, as well as significant improvements in mood, sleep, quality of life, sleep quality, and fatigue in um, a mixed cancer population. And basically what those studies are telling us, it's not that you have to do yoga, it's not that you have to do meditation, it's that by managing stress, you can improve um, adjunctive symptoms and psychological symptoms as well as improving quality of life. So I just found a couple of statistics that the reported prevalence of cancer related distress is 24 to 59% which to me quite honestly seemed a little bit low. And I guess it depends for each individual what their support system's like and a few other of these pieces. But 46% of participants experience significant levels of anxious thinking related to managing the cost of their cancer care. And the reason why I add this here is because these stress management techniques and interventions, they, they work across the board for multiple different kinds of stress. So I wanted to pull a couple different things. So how stress response can impact you. There can be physio, oh, I'm sorry. My watch decided to join us. Um, there can be physiological or physical symptoms like change in sleep, change in appetite, increased heart rate, or even those physiological symptoms of panic, psychological or emotional symptoms like feeling down, angry, or numb, increased irritability or increased worry, and changes in behaviors or relationships like isolation, um, not for health reasons or COVID related reasons, but because we're not really in the mood to interact with people or not finding the time or finding the energy to do things that we used to enjoy, not because of physical reasons. So as I go through these, I want um, you, if you feel comfortable, to just take note of any of these responses that may be applying to you right now um, in response to any stress event or any stressor that is going on. So what does toxic stress look like? The immediate responses tend to look like underreacting or overreacting, either explosive or dissociative responses, an increase in irritability, tearfulness or crying, being more withdrawn, and even being angry. Behavioral responses can sometimes look like outbursts or explosive behaviors, increased startle reaction, restlessness or sleep and appetite disturbances. And the immediate physical responses of stress that we see are often nausea or GI distress, sweating or shivering, faintness, muscle tremors or uncontrollable shaking, elevated heartbeat, so an increase in your heart rate, shortness of breath, increase in blood pressure, extreme fatigue or exhaustion, greater startle responses, and even a feeling like you might not be real or you might not be in your body. So those out of body moments where you feel like you're watching yourself on the outside or like you go on autopilot. And then the longer term impacts, um, there's a lot of psychological impacts of long-term toxic stress. So when that stress level gets really high, it actually does change our brain chemistry. And those psychological responses can look like depression, mood swings, irritability, anxiety responses, fear of a trauma recurrence, which in this sense means fear of additional stressors or feel of a fear of a stressful event happening again, grief reactions, shame, feelings of fragility or vulnerability, emotional detachment, negative feelings about others or the world, feeling physically or emotionally unsafe, and social relationship disturbances. And all of those things, you know, it's normative to a certain extent. And where we start to get really concerned is when it impacts the person or causes a lot of distress. 
the behavioral things that we see after long periods of exposure to toxic stress, avoidance of event reminders, decreased activity level, engagement in high risk behaviors, and sometimes an increased use of alcohol and drugs, but that really is any substance or anything that we use to self-medicate, which can even be like emotional eating or binge eating, um, maybe eating things that aren't, that aren't good for us, overuse of caffeine. It doesn't only have to be substance use related. And then the physical responses that we see oftentimes in those longer term exposures to toxic stress, sleep disturbances with nightmares, an increased focus and worry about body aches and pains, appetite and digestive changes, lower resistance to colds and infections. And that's one of the things that's really important with stress management and co-occurring physical um, or medical health diagnoses. Persistent fatigue, elevated cortisol or stress levels, hyperarousal, so feeling really activated or keyed up, and long-term health effects. Um, more often, or I guess not more often, more potential to have negative outcomes of care events, difficulty with recovering after injury or after treatment, um, a lot more physical aches, pains, and perception of pain or physical discomfort becoming worse. So one thing to note here is that depending on what else is going on, or if you are receiving active radiation or chemotherapy treatment, some of the physiological responses that I just talked about can be directly related to treatment or to diagnosis. So we wanna also parse out what is more stress-based versus what is normative for what is going on in, in the body. The good thing about resilience building and stress management is that we can even re help reduce the distress and the negative impact of physiological symptoms or those physical symptoms not related to stress only. So taking care of your body and practicing stress management can make you feel better overall, even not just related to the stress symptoms. So the intersection of general stress and health-related stressors. So general stress is in quotes there because it is anything outside of health-related stressors. So in addition to psychosocial stressors associated with a cancer diagnosis, Individuals also often face non-health-related psychosocial stressors, meaning that we're people outside of the diagnosis, outside of the treatment, outside of their survivor experience, wherever somebody's at, we all have things that stress us out. Various stressors can compound or exacerbate psychological and physical effects of COVID-19, as well as um, any, any other physical disorder or disease. And it's important to be aware of those cumulative effects of stressors because it's kind of like when you put something in a junk drawer, the more that you pile in without taking out, eventually you're not gonna be able to close that drawer. So eventually you're gonna to get to that toxic stress response level. So how do we address the cumulative stress response? And that is a rhetorical question for this, so we can move forward. So the overlap between resilience strategies for management of stress associated with the pandemic and cancer is huge, which is great because that means that we don't need to learn a whole bunch of new skills. We just want to look for a couple of things that work for each individual person and practice them regularly to help manage overall stress levels, which are shown to have, like I said, the correlation with an improved quality of life and as well as improved patient outcomes with treatment. So resilience is the idea that our bodies and brains have the capacity to adapt to long-term stress and heal from trauma or chronic stress events. And if I didn't mention it before, um, I meant to, that cancer is a, is a chronic stress event. It's a long-term stress on our body. So we don't only have, like I said, the psychological stressors, but also physical stressors that have an impact on our overall well-being. And those things intersect. They play with each other, meaning that our psychological health and our mental health and our physical health are so connected and they feed into one another. The good news is that our brain is continually changing in response to the environment. And if the toxic stress stops and is replaced by practices that build resilience, the brain can actually undo many of the stress induced changes. So we can retrain our brain and rewrite our neurochemistry to a certain extent to get back to where it was before that toxic stress event. 
and there is well-documented research on how individuals' brains and bodies become healthier through mindfulness practices, exercise, good nutrition, adequate sleep, and healthy social interactions. Healthy social interactions is so important here. Um, so much of our research does show that individuals who have the perception that they have good social support overall have better medical outcomes, better psychological outcomes, report feeling happier and report an overall higher quality of life than those that report not feeling as though they have a social support. And the reason I say feel is because it doesn't actually matter how many friends, family members, community members that that person has. It's about the perception of quality of support rather than the quantity of support. So even having one good person or one good support, and that can include animals as well, is so protective here. Okay. So some basic strategies to increase resilience. Um, monitor yourself. Check in, how are you doing with those symptoms that we just went over? Are you noticing any changes in yourself outside of those things? Feeling more down, feeling more anxious, feeling more worried. So noticing any changes like that can be so helpful in knowing when it's time to take action and be proactive about stress management, or if it's a little bit too late to be proactive, to be able to address the stress that's there, address the tension and walk back to baseline. Taking time to care for yourself is so important and that is taking care of your physical self, your spiritual self, your emotional self, your psychological self, all the different aspects. And then even just making time to sit down and do nothing if that's something that you need. Taking time to be intentional about doing self-care and practicing stress management. Focusing on the power of positive emotions is huge in resilience building. And we'll talk about gratitude a little bit more a little bit later. It's important to limit yourself to a certain extent. So you don't wanna push yourself to do things that um, like scheduling too many appointments or activities on the same day or overbooking yourself. And that is both for psychological and physical health, especially if you're experiencing fatigue or any other types of like aches, pains, things of that nature. By putting too much on your plate, it can be really difficult to keep moving the next day or to get everything done, which can cause some disappointment, some irritability, sometimes some anger, depending on the context. Help yourself by asking for help, seeking additional support when needed, whether that's from a friend, family member, community member, spiritual leader, mental health professional, um, anyone who is a trusted individual to ask for support from and then renewing yourself by engaging in activities that you find meaningful and enjoyable. It doesn't have to be something big or something huge, just something that matters to you. Okay, so a little bit more on these different strategies. Seeking support, again, from family members, friends, coworkers, faith-based support, behavioral health support when needed, pets, any, anyone or anything, that gives you that supported, warm and fuzzy feeling. Focusing on what is in your control, again, really important because when we're feeling that level of toxic stress or even tolerable stress, but it's, it's kind of edging into toxic or unhelpful stress levels, things can feel really out of control and overwhelming. It can feel like things are happening to us rather than us being active participants in our own lives in different ways. And when we focus on what we have control over in the here and now, what happens is our brain actually says, okay, I'm doing the things that I can do right now. I'm aware of what I can do and what I can't do. And it can move on from some of those worries and some of those overwhelming feelings. Oftentimes we have way more control than what it feels like in the moments that we're feeling very overwhelmed. Identify positive things that are happening in the world or plan things to look forward to. Again, they don't have to be big giant things. They don't have to be expensive vacations or anything like that. It could be looking forward to a TV show or having a phone conversation with somebody, making a certain meal for dinner, whatever is meaningful, important to you and that you get enjoyment out of. Take care of your physical health by staying hydrated, staying active as much as possible 
And that doesn't need to be intense exercise. It can be things like restorative yoga, stretching, walking, just making sure you get some movement in. And then staying nourished, um, both physically and spiritually. Disconnecting from the media, including social media, is really huge with stress management. There's so much information out there. There's so many opinions out there. It can be really stressful to constantly be getting an overload of information. So take time to give yourself permission to disconnect. Maybe don't watch the news or be mindful about what news media you engage with or news outlets you engage with. Take a break from social media if you're finding that it causes more stress than support. But giving yourself that, that permission to unplug can be really powerful. And then practicing relaxation and mindfulness techniques, engaging your parasympathetic nervous system to co combat stress responses with deep breathing and muscle relaxation. And that parasympathetic nervous system is the opposite of that fight or flight response. So that fight or flight response is our bodies and our brain's natural reaction to stress and high stress. It causes our heart rate to increase. It causes us to get ready to get out of dodge if we need to. We get muscle tension, panicky symptoms, shortness of breath sometimes. And when we engage our parasympathetic nervous system or that deactivating system, what actually happens is we're telling our brains that we're good and we're calm and we can be calm and it lowers your blood pressure in the moment. It can improve chest pain and cardiac symptoms, not cardiac disease. I wanna be careful about saying that. It can help improve our feelings of wellness and help us get relaxation and deep and good sleep. Another really important thing is no signs of when it becomes time to seek professional support services. And that's not a deficit. There's a lot going on for everyone and it is a normal human response to have reactions to stress. And sometimes those reactions get a little bit too big for what we know how to handle on our own. So some really specific coping strategies. This feels redundant, but I promise it's because it is so important to practice mindfulness and relaxation interventions regularly. You don't need a lot of time. You don't need a big, to make a big commitment to practice mindfulness. Mindfulness is simply the idea that coming into the present moment and out of future oriented thinking or past oriented thinking helps us to maintain a sense of control and calm over what we can do for ourselves, where we are in the present moment and to manage things as best as we can. So it might be taking 30 seconds to notice anything that's around you in, in your current environment, naming a few things that you can see in detail bringing yourself back into your physical body by taking a few deep breaths. Sometimes even tapping the tops of your legs can be helpful. If you're feeling like you have racing thoughts or things are just really overwhelming to remind you, hey, you're here. So mindfulness is just the practice of doing anything with intention and paying attention to the present moment without judgment. It doesn't have to be long. It doesn't have to be 30 minutes in a row, anything like that. The three M's of coping are meeting, moving, and making. So meeting is maintaining social connections, meeting up with people in whatever way is socially distant and safe and responsible for you. It might be FaceTime, telephone calls, when the weather was a little bit nicer, maybe doing a socially distant walk or something. That's gonna look a little bit different for everyone and everyone's relationships, but maintaining good connections with our social support networks is so important moving, staying physically active, anything that you enjoy is something that is beneficial here. So if you enjoy walking, if you enjoy yoga, if you enjoy more intensive exercise, if that's your thing, anything that keeps you physically active is helpful in managing stress because exercise and activity releases endorphins or calming happiness chemicals in our brains that help us to reduce cortisol levels, reduce overall impact of stress, calm ourselves down and work out psychological things as well. Exercise just overall improves mood. Making is doing anything that has a concrete start and a concrete finish. It can be something creative. It can be any task at all, reading a book, 
putting something away, organizing a closet, really anything that you can say, this is where it started and this is where it ended. And the reason why concrete tasks are so important is when things feel overwhelming, it can feel like there's not a lot of progress or not a lot of movement. And when we see, okay, I, I finished this thing, I started this thing and this thing ended, and you can look at the outcome of something that you did, it helps us to remember that even when things feel like they're stagnant, oftentimes they are moving and that it doesn't, we don't need to see all the progress in every single aspect to see progress in other aspects or other tasks that we're doing. Keeping a routine as much as possible helps reduce decision fatigue. So when we keep a routine, we know what we're doing, our brains know what to expect, and it increases a sense of safety, which is really helpful when dealing with stress. Also, when we're stressed out, we can feel fatigued, our brains can feel a little bit foggy. There's a lot of mental energy going towards managing that stress. So it's difficult to make decisions or plan things or really do new things sometimes when the stress gets really bad. So if you keep a routine, you can reduce the amount of new decisions that you have to make every single day, which sounds really silly, but even things as simple as how am I going to spend my time or what am I going to do after breakfast? Am I going to have breakfast? Do I want to go here, there, wherever? It can also eat up a lot of mental energy and contribute to fatigue and that overwhelmed feeling. Practicing compassion for yourself and compassion for others is huge. Self-compassion is the act of treating ourselves with the same kindness and patience that we give others and having compassion for other people, knowing that we're all experiencing this collective stress event and who knows what else is going on for other people in their lives. So approaching people with the same compassion and respect that we would want them to approach us with. The reason why that helps is it reduces our feelings of irritability, frustration, and being bothered both with ourselves where we can get self-critical and externally where we can become frustrated and kind of stew on things that are going on outside of our control. Taking time to find the good. Again, it's huge. We'll talk about gratitude in just a minute. And then practicing safety behaviors. So identifying concrete behaviors and concrete ways that you can keep yourself safe during the pandemic increases a feeling of control and reduces that feeling of being overwhelmed. So it might be things like wearing uh, protective gear, like a mask, gloves if it's necessary, um, being careful about who you spend time with, uh, social distancing and practicing the CDC guidelines and those guidelines that were discussed in our presentation before. So really making sure that you are doing everything that is within your control to keep yourself safe. And the reason why that helps is because when we can tell ourselves and our brain if it's feeling anxious, that we, do, we are doing everything that we can that's within our control. Oftentimes that helps to relieve the anxiety of the things that are outside of our control. Okay, so gratitude, focusing on the good. Gratitude is a positive emotion that is experienced when people perceive uh, that they have received a valued benefit. And that is psychological jargon for saying that we feel good when we do good things, when we recognize good things, when we look at good things, when we acknowledge that there's something positive that's happening. Research has linked gratitude with various um, indices of well-being, including decreased depression, increased positive life appraisals, positive affect or positive mood, perceived meaning in life, and life satisfaction. That's huge there because that means that where we put our focus actually has the power to shift the way that our brain works and the way that our brain perceives things. If we focus on things that we're grateful for or things that are positive or things that are more or less okay, we're gonna have a different outlook on things. And we're gonna have a different quality of life. And we're gonna have different outcomes than if we only focus on things that are negative or overwhelming or scary or anxiety provoking. Because it's one of the laws of physics and it applies to our thoughts as well. The things that we focus on get bigger. So when we're able to focus on the good and the gratitude, it really does shift that mood and that, that way of thinking. So positive emotions linked like gratefulness also help us to widen our mental openness and create creativity. So it increases our mental flexibility to see things in different ways. The grateful mindset is also more likely to encourage help seeking behavior. So when we feel that things are valued and we have things of value happening, we're more likely to ask for help if we need it. 
expressions of gratitude help in building and sustaining long-term relationships, managing stress, and bouncing back from adversity with strength and motivation. So it is super linked to resilience and the connection between gratitude and happiness is multi-dimensional. Multi when you express gratitude, not only to others, but also to yourself, it induces positive emotions like happiness. And by producing feelings of pleasure and contentment, gratitude impacts our overall health and well-being. Meaning that when we express gratitude or when we show ourselves gratitude, when we acknowledge things that we well, our brain actually lights up in the same areas as experiencing other pleasurable and meaningful events. So we can create that same neurological experience for ourselves just by showing gratitude to the people in our lives, to things in our lives, just acknowledging that there is good. And even if it's something as small as saying, if, you know, stop every day and say, if this isn't nice right now, I don't know what is about a flower, about the leaves changing, about a good conversation with a friend or a family member, that does wonders for your overall mood and your overall physical health too. Because those positive emotions release those happy chemicals that reduce those stress chemicals and reduce the physical and psychological impact of psychological and health stressors. So that was a lot of information in that one slide. We're almost done for questions, but Especially if there's any questions there, I'd be really happy to talk about the relationship between gratitude and well-being. So some specific relaxation strategies to keep in mind are deep breathing, like the mindfulness activity that we practiced earlier um, in, our, in this presentation. You can practice deep breathing pretty much anywhere. I recommend people practice uh, deep breathing a few times throughout the day because it helps to set the baseline for a relaxed and calm state of mind and physical well-being throughout the day. So if you think about it, like starting your day off in a calm state, practicing deep breathing again, maybe mid-morning, mid-afternoon and before bed, you're gonna reduce that overall stress level as it creeps up and end your day at a lower stress level than if you weren't to do any deep breathing or relaxation um, interventions at all. Guided imagery or mindfulness meditations are really helpful for some people. If you find them, them helpful, again, I encourage people to use them at least once a day, typically before bed or in the morning to set the intention for the day. They don't need to be super long. Even practicing mindfulness for as little as two to five minutes um, can have a really huge impact on uh, cortisol levels, on blood pressure, on heart rate, and those physical symptoms of stress, and also on our overall psychological well-being. Keeping a gratitude journal, it sounds a little bit cheesy maybe, but it is so helpful and so impactful for so many people. It doesn't have to be things that are overly optimistic or positive, just things that you notice that you have gratitude for. Setting time aside for yourself. Again, it doesn't matter how much time necessarily, it's about the intention of showing yourself that compassion and that care. I think it is worth setting aside time to take care of your own needs. Recovery stretching or trauma-informed yoga, anything to keep you active. I really like recovery stretching because it helps with joint pain, it helps with mobility, it helps keep you moving, it's really gentle, it doesn't take a lot of physicality to do it, and it helps relax our bodies and our brains with just getting um, a good airflow going, focusing on our breath, focusing on the present moment, and listening to what our body needs. And then listening to music or journaling, classic relaxation strategies, um, I like those specifically because they are so personalizable to each unique individual person. So it can be any music that makes you feel calm, relaxed, is linked to a happy memory or positive emotion for you, or journaling about things. Um, even journaling about things that are causing stress or causing anxiety has a positive effect because what happens is our brain thinks that we think in full thoughts, but we don't. We actually think in thought fragments. And when we journal or we write things down, what it's doing is it's slowing those thoughts down enough to make them into full, fully formed thoughts. And then when we write them down, it gives us some space. So we're not just keeping those thoughts or those anxieties inside our head, which feels so close to us. We're actually writing them down, getting them out and getting some psychological distance from those as well. Okay. 
And just a little note on when to seek professional support. If you're noticing that your stress level is causing significant impairment in functioning at work, at home, or in relationships, if you're feeling anxious, down, angry, or disconnected most of the day, nearly every day, experiencing a significant loss of interest in things you used to enjoy or difficulty doing things at all, not because of physical pain, sleep disturbance or panic symptoms that cause difficulties in other areas. For example, if you're not sleeping uh, very much at all and it's making it unsafe to do things like drive or leave, or if it's causing you to miss out on things that you would enjoy doing otherwise, that's a good time to seek help. Feelings of helplessness or hopelessness, or any time that you have the desire for additional emotional support and stress management techniques. Okay, questions. So again, thank you all for bearing with me. I know it's a lot of information, it's a lot of psych terms. So if there's anything that you would like follow up about or that didn't quite click or make sense, please let me know. Thank you very much, Dr. Smoter. I'd like to also uh, let everybody know that they should continue to write in the chat box if they have questions. And we uh, do have some questions for you, Dr. Smoter. What tips do you have for somebody who has had cancer recently and is still processing the journey during the pandemic? That is a really excellent question. I think having patience with yourself, with the process. It looks so different for every single person. Um, our experiences are different, but it, I wish that I could say that healing is a linear journey and it really isn't psychologically as well either. So we wanna help people to be patient, take time, address their needs and be really reflective about what it is that you're needing in these moments to show yourself that care in, in processing your journey. That sounds like a really crunchy, not very specific response. And it's so difficult because again, each person is so different. All of our needs really do vary. But if you can help yourself by managing stress responses, by giving yourself time, and by normalizing that it's, it's difficult and dealing with that on top of the pandemic and throughout the pandemic, it's even more difficult. So the responses that you're having are normative and you don't have to go through that those pieces alone, I would recommend if you're really struggling with processing through that, um, continuing to work with Gilda's Club for support, um, seeking additional individual services if that's something where it would help to have more of those personalized individual conversations. Thank you. Next question. What tips do you have for uh, isolation during the winter with COVID when people cannot get outdoors and out of the house as much? That is such a good question and something that I think all of us are really um, thinking a lot about as it gets colder here in Chicago. One thing is maintaining social connections, even if you can't see people in person, getting on FaceTime, getting on Zoom, it's not necessarily the same. There's a lot of really great resources for connecting with people through video chat. You can set up things like a virtual dinner with friends, virtual game nights, through some different apps and different technology platforms. So it's not the same, but it is, you know, a, it's a good substitute for what we're working with to maintain safety and to reduce the spread of uh, COVID during the winter time while still getting some social needs met during um, cold weather. We also want to set up a routine to make sure that you're doing other things that you would be doing normally. Even though you're more isolated, we can't go outside. Maybe, you know, if you're somebody who likes walking, for example, making the time to find a little path to walk in your home. It's not necessarily the same, but there's some guided meditations and guided walking for mindfulness that you can do anywhere, even if it, you have just a room to walk around. So making sure that you're still getting some physical activity in, making sure that you're taking care of yourself, getting outside when you can, just to get some vitamin D and some sunlight and some fresh air so you don't get stir crazy, and then keeping that routine. Vitamin D, sunlight, and getting outside, I think are very important. Mm -hmm. And I also agree with you in regards to journaling, Dr. Smoter. I know uh, I don't journal, but if I am not happy with somebody and I want to speak with them. I want to formulate my thoughts first and I write them down. And after a while, I look at them and think, ah, 
what was I worried about that for? So I think journaling helps in that regard also is that it helps you put your thoughts in perspective and you see them in a different light once they're journaled. That is right on. So again, our thoughts feel like reality to us because they're in our head and it's how we make sense of the world. But when we can write them down, we are able to get some of that space and see them in a different way. Or something that might be kind of nagging at us internally, once we write it down, take a minute and then come back to it, we can see that maybe it's not totally as right on as it felt before we journaled it out. Thank you. Do you have any recommendations of links or sites or um, areas where people can go and do uh, have yoga in their home, uh, stress management programs in their home, since it's difficult to get outside now? Absolutely. So YouTube is a fantastic resource for all things yoga, all things mindfulness, all things relaxation and meditation. So um, I can put in the chat um, in a couple of minutes a list of different yoga resources that are available for free through YouTube and online platforms. Yoga with Adrienne is fantastic. She does a lot of recovery, stretching, and things that you don't have to be particularly advanced in yoga practice to benefit from um, just Googling a guided imagery. Find one that you like. Find one that's not too long for you. Find one who's the speaker's voice you can stand, which sounds silly, but it's so important when you're trying to relax. Doing some progressive muscle relaxations that you can find on YouTube as well. So I will upload a document to the chat in just a few minutes with some of those resources, but there's so much free stuff online and it's such a wealth of different things that can, you can really find the things that work best for you and that you connect with the most. Thank you. And one last question. I meditate but still have problems sleeping. Do you have any suggestions on getting better sleep? Absolutely. So meditation is great. It is not the be all end all of relaxation. Sometimes we're not sleeping for a lot of different reasons. It might be, you know, difficulty with slowing our mind down enough to get good sleep, physical pain, physical discomfort, racing thoughts that, you know, are difficult to slow down. So there's a lot of different things that can be impacting sleep. I would say progressive muscle relaxation is one of the best sleep aids, the best psychological sleep aids or non-pharmacological pharmacological sleep aids out there because what it does is it brings your brain into the present moment, you have to focus on tensing and then relaxing different areas of your body very slowly. So it takes all of your mental energy away from whatever the worries are, the thoughts are that are causing distress. And you're also signaling to your body, it's okay to be relaxed right now. You get a lot of benefits in reducing muscle tension and reducing physical aches and pain um, from doing those activities, from doing the tension and then the relaxation and by the time you get all the way through, most people, if they're feeling kind of exhausted when they start, maybe get through half of their body before they um, fall asleep because you're using all your mental energy. So you get a break from the mental distress. You're physically relaxing yourself. You're slowing down your breathing. So physiologically, your heart rate is slowing and your body says, I'm cool, I'm good, I'm safe. I can relax enough to fall asleep. It also helps improve sleep to be in that relaxed state when you fall asleep. So people also report getting more sleep, getting deeper sleep and feeling more relaxed after sleep when they practice progressive muscle relaxation prior to bed. I'm a firm believer in progressive muscular relaxation. It's helped me tremendously, but you have to give it a try and practice it, correct? Absolutely. And all of these things, I would say it might not work all the way for you. It might not work the first time for you. Consistency and tweaking it is the biggest thing. Stress management looks so different for each one of us that it's about trying different things and then finding ways to apply them that are doable so that you can, can be doing these things consistently throughout the day for overall improvement in stress management, well-being, sleep, relaxation, health outcomes, all of that great stuff. Thank you much, very, uh, very much, Dr. Smoter. Your information was greatly appreciated and very helpful for all of us. So thank you, have a good evening. And we are moving on now with our last presenter. Uh, her name is Sharon Fushi. And Sharon, um, as Dr. Smoter stated, good nutrition helps fight the effects of stress. So this is a great transition on the health benefits of garlic. 
Sharon Fershey started Garlic Breath Farm in 2015. It is located in Elburn, Illinois. Her mission is to provide the freshest and most flavorful organic garlic to restaurants, groceries, and to the community. They are often found at areas farmers markets. Actually, I found Sharon in Frankfurt. So not this year, but years past. Uh, Sharon is also very personally related to this program. She is currently undergoing chemotherapy for breast cancer, but was determined to continue with this presentation. So you know she is dedicated to providing education awareness and information on the topic of breast cancer. We thank you for taking time out of your convalescing period, Sharon, to provide us with this important information. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I appreciate everyone. I'm going to go ahead and pull up the slide. And I do have to say, I have, uh, I have spoke before in front of crowds, never followed uh, two doctors, though. So um, I do uh, appreciate Dr. Smoter's um, the uh, relaxation uh, techniques. And, uh, and I very much appreciate that because I'm using those now. So let me go ahead and get my slides set up and ready. All right. So good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here tonight to talk to you about garlic. My name is Sharon Fershey, and I'm the shorter half of Garlic Breath Farm. We're a husband and wife run organic garlic farm out of Elburn, Illinois. We became farmers about five years ago, incidentally, because we were looking for a new home closer to work that'll, that would allow us to keep our pet pig, Kevin Bacon. To make the move a success, we left normal subdivision with sidewalks in exchange for land that we can envision being a future organic micro farm. And the reason we selected garlic was that we, because we realized that it contained medicinal benefits we respected, and we not only wanted to grow it, but educate those in our community on the topic. So here we are today. And the garlic we grow is not the kind of garlic that you find in the store. In fact, the garlic we grow is higher in Allison than the store-bought stuff. I'll speak on that later, but in the meantime, please note that we are sold out for uh, the year and this is not a sales pitch. This is because we have a passion for helping others and I thank you again for joining me here tonight. So let's get started. So what's with garlic? Is it new to helping enhancing uh, the, the human health? Not even close. A recurring theme throughout early history is that garlic was given to the laboring classes, presumably to maintain and increase their strength, thereby enabling them to work harder and be more productive. This has been seen in early documentation from ancient Egypt. In fact, scientists have even found medical texts pointing to garlic being used as remedies. Furthermore, do you know what they found in King, uh, King Tut's tomb? Very well-preserved garlic cloves. Yikes. Even the Bible references garlic. It mentions that garlic was often part of the daily diet. On leaving Egypt, the Bible references the slaves missed their fish, cucumbers, melons, leeks, and even the garlic. And Talmud, which is an interpretive writing of the Bible, also recorded the many benefits of garlic and recommended it for married couples. Did I mention garlic increases blood flow? So for ancient Greece, during the first Olympic Games, garlic was taken by athletes before they competed. It was used to protect skin against poisons or toxins. Even Hippocrates, the father of medicine, used garlic in many remedies. He knew that if we didn't use food as our medicine, we would eventually need to use medicine as our food. In ancient Rome, garlic was fed to troops and to sailors for strength. In the book on natural history, and it was one of the few books that made it out of the Roman Empire, uh, in there, it was talking about how they used garlic for uh, helping the Romans with digestion, animal bites, arthritis, and even convulsions. Later, garlic was also used for respiratory ailments as well as uh, to help treat parasites. So from a garlic variety perspective, worldwide, there's about 600 varieties of garlic. I know this blows away a lot of people because they think, I went to the store and I just saw one. It's always the same looking kind of garlic. Well, no, there's tons of varieties. Think tomatoes, but, but garlic. The two types that are uh, the main uh, 
uh, types of garlic are hard neck and soft neck. Hard neck is typically grown in the Midwest and requires a cold winter. This is the type we grow. This is the kind of garlic, um, or, I'm sorry, the kind of garlic that you purchase at the grocery store is called soft neck. And the reason they sell soft neck garlic is because it can be grown uh, year round because it's uh, grown in warmer weather. And let me switch to nutrition facts. So from a nutrition fact perspective, garlic is a nutritional superstar. It's packed with vitamins B, C, manganese, selenium, iron, copper, potassium. It might be small, but its benefits are mighty. And please note that in the nutrition fact picture that I'm showing, it's for three cloves of garlic, not just one. Three cloves is how many I would like you to have per day if you're looking to safely benefit from it, and it's really the most that you should be having. I'll touch on that a little bit later, so hang tight. For now, just know this little powerhouse vegetable gives you a lot more than just bad breath. It also gives you allicin. So what is allicin? Allicin's an oily chemical compound found in garlic that packs a superfood punch. It's a combination of two other chemicals when, uh, when put under pressure, hopefully through a garlic press, will release a chemically unstable compound that contains antibacterial, antimicrobial, and anti-cancer benefits that we're all looking for. And please, if you take nothing else away from this presentation today, please understand that to receive the highest medicinal benefits from garlic, you need to use a garlic press. Then after you press it, wait 15 minutes for the allicin to be at, at its peak level and then consume it. And you can typically mix it with something else to help uh, cut the flavor. I like to use honey or peanut butter. Um, I'll, I'll speak more on that in a little bit. And yes, allicin can be consumed in a supplemental form, but the strongest benefits come from fresh garlic. So garlic versus illness. So let's go over some findings that Amanda Bacco, a nutritionist at Northwestern Medicine in McHenry, um, and what she found regarding garlic versus some of the common illnesses that we face. She says garlic promotes heart health. Garlic has been shown to exert cholesterol and triglyceride lowering actions. This leads to overall protection for your heart, including reduced cholesterol and lowered blood pressure. She's also found that garlic contains cancer-fighting characteristics. Significant evidence suggests that garlic can play a role in the prevention of cancer and the slowing of its progression. Garlic's rich phytochemical content delivers its potential cholesterol-lowering and cancer-fighting characteristics, says Baco. Phytochemicals are chemical compounds found in plants that protect cells from damage that lead to cancer. And garlic potentially combats the common cold as well. Although research is limited, some studies show that individuals were less likely to get a cold after taking garlic supplements. This is thought to be because of garlic's antimicrobial and antibiotic properties, which stop the growth of unwanted organisms. Garlic does act, act as a natural antibiotic. So garlic has a significant antibacterial property that helps protect against certain infections. This is particularly important for strains resistance resistant to antibiotics, including MRSA. Though it, is, though it should not replace treatment by your physician, garlic can offer protective benefits as a supplement. And it also clears your skin. Because of its antibacterial properties, garlic can help reduce swelling and inflammation from acne. And although some people suggest using it topically to treat skin conditions from acne to athlete's foot, it's best to avoid placing garlic directly on your skin as it can cause a rash a burning sensation, and in rare cases, blistering. With all the amazing things garlic can do, hopefully one day it'll even put away the laundry. So what about cancer? That's why you're really here, isn't it? So I spend a lot of my, I spend a lot of my time coming through scientific articles and trying to find studies with the latest information on garlic's impact on tumors and cancer as a whole. This is a very personal topic to me. And so one of my favorite resources is the U.S. National Library of Medicine's National Institute of Health. According to these folks, altering dietary habits may be a practical and cost-effective means of reducing cancer and modifying tumor behavior. They've also gone on record saying that 30 to 40 percent of cancers are preventable by appropriate food and nutrition, physical activity, 
and maintenance of healthy body weight. This means choosing foods that help to maintain a healthy body weight, reducing consumption of foods such as red or processed meats that may increase cancer risk, and increasing consumption of foods that may decrease cancer risk, including foods of plant origin. There is an increasing public health demand to identify those dietary patterns, bioactive foods, and components that may decrease cancer. One particular group of foods that has raised considerable interest for their wonderful cancer providing preventative properties is the allium genus. I don't know if you know this, but allium is the lat Latin word for garlic. And according to the folks over at the National Institute of Health, in one study, garlic reportedly inhibited the growth of tumors in mice. In another study, aged garlic extract was used to reduce the risk of cancer and prevent the decline of the natural killer cells in patients with advanced cancer. Garlic constituents have been studied extensively and various derivatives of garlic were reported to inhibit the growth of several cancer types. All right, so what about stomach cancer? In a recent meta-analysis of 19 case control and two cohort studies, it showed that consumption of large amounts of total allium vegetable reduced risk of gastric cancer when comparing the highest and lowest uh, consumption groups. Another hormone-driven cancer is prostate cancer. And in a population-based uh, control study in Shanghai, it was found that individuals in the highest of three intake categories of total allium vegetables had a 53% 53 decrease, 53 decreased odds uh, ratio of prostate cancer compared to those with the lower uh, list intake. And of course, breast cancer. That's why we're here. In numerous studies, garlic has been shown to inhibit the growth of tumors in mice. It has reduced the risk of cancer and prevented the decline of natural killer cells in patients with advanced cancer. For those of you who do not know, natural killer cells are the good guys. Garlic has also been shown to inhibit the growth of several cancer types, including the MCF7 and MDA-MB435 type cells. These are the bad guys. Some additional information on the bad guy cancer cells in breast cancer are as follows. The MDA-MB435, which are the common cells of metastatic human breast cancer, when these cancer cells were exposed to garlic, it arrested their behavior. For the MCF7, which is often uh, used in ER positive breast cancer studies, and ER positive, as many of you probably know, means that the cancer responds to the person's estrogen levels, and it is also the most common form of breast cancer. In one of these studies, it found that after two to three hours of exposure to garlic extract, and it was fresh, fresh garlic, not boiled, it was sufficient to arrest the growth and alter the morphology of the MCF7 cells. The reason the study pointed out that the garlic was not boiled was because the number one thing you lose when cooking garlic is its allicin content. It diminished quickly in response to cook time. It's no big deal if you're a chef, but if you're a cancer warrior like me, freshly pressed garlic is your best option. Then in another study, when the MCF7 cells were exposed to fresh garlic extract, within one hour, the cells began to alter their morphology. After two to four hours, garlic-treated MCF7 cells became morphologically distinct, started getting a little disorganized, and then lost their cell-to-cell -cell contact. In contrast, the boiled garlic I was telling you about, it failed to alter the morphology. The results were confirmed multiple times with garlic bulbs obtained from various sources, and the results were reproduced using two independent sources of the MCF7 cells. All right, so fresh versus cooked garlic. What's in it for you? So like I was saying before, the uh, roasted garlic, the cooked garlic, the boiled garlic, however you're gonna cook it, um, it, it can be quite tasty. However, it's not necessarily the best um, idea for you if we're gonna be talking about garnering the uh, anti-cancer benefits. Okay, here, I lost my cursor, there we go. And then, so how about this organic thing? I'm sure you all see it in the stores and uh, some of you may go out of your way, especially if you're fighting cancer 
and trying to make sure that most of the, uh, most of the foods that you get have um, the organic symbol in them. But I'm sure sometimes you wonder, is it even really worth it? Well, I can tell you as an organic farm, um, they're, they're really serious about what they do. In fact, we will have um, surprise inspections where they'll come out and they'll actually take plant tissues from all over our farm and send them to a lab. And I really felt like if more people knew that that's, that's what they did and that was part of the organic certification process, that it would be more respected and, and it just, to me, it was, a, it was a marketing issue on the uh, organic folk side. So I wanted to share that with you today. So invest in your health in 15 minutes. And this is where I am talking about Allison is worth the wait. And Allison, again, that's the antimicrobial, antibacterial, anti-cancer component inside of garlic. And so if you press the garlic and you eat it right away, it's tasty, but you, you would benefit so much more if you were just wait that 15 minutes and allow it to peak. And, um, and that's why uh, we really try to harp on that. You really are worth the wait. And if you set a timer, 15 minutes actually really kind of seems like a long time. So you wanna kind of get in the habit of figuring out what you're gonna do while you're waiting for that. And you can do it up to three times a day safely. All right. So how much is enough? And I touched on that earlier. So right now for somebody like, um, somebody like me, and this is kind of um, interesting. So with our company, we always sell different um, healthcare kits, cancer care kits. Well, when I realized that I had, um, that my cancer was back, the first thing I did was I put myself back on the garlic breath cancer care kit option three. And option three is simply uh, where you take it three times a day, kind of stagger it throughout the day, press the garlic, let it sit 15 minutes, mix it up with something. And um, that is just the best thing you can do. And I do, I am doing chemo and um, there, there is, I'll, I'll touch on that as well because I'm sure some of you are just like, how could I possibly combine those two concepts? So, oh, it's next. So how to navigate raw garlic during chemo. So a lot of you know the, the struggle with chemo is it changes the flavor of food, you have mouth sores, things hurt. And so um, it was really kind of um, a blessing to um, you know, help me navigate it and see firsthand how can, we, how can we do this and how can we get this done. And so one of my favorite ways to do it is, um, like I said earlier, where you mix it with um, a clove of garlic, you press it for 15 minutes, you wait, and then uh, I mix it with two tablespoons of peanut butter. That is my absolute favorite way. And um, a lot of people laugh at me, um, but I'm telling you, you gotta try it. You gotta try it, it's so good. And, um, and other people also like to mix it with uh, a tablespoon of honey, so that's also an option. And then, um, I have a quick video over here. Let's see if I can play it. This is on, no, oh, it doesn't look like it's gonna play on that. Excuse me a second, I've got multiple things going. Okay, well, it looks like the audio is not working on that. All right, so essentially all that is, is a, a video showing you about how to press the garlic and um, just use the garlic clove and then there's the press. That's one of the presses that we sell. I just like it because it's easy to clean. I'm all about convenience. Kind of trim it off. Let it wait the 15 minutes. There's the peanut butter. I'm telling you guys, you're going to try it tomorrow. I can feel it. I also like to dip it with some apples. So it's just, it's quite a delicious meal and it's um, super, super delicious and super healthy. All right, so medicinal gardening. This is something, garlic is actually a really easy crop to grow. And um, as it turns out, October, not only Breast, breast Cancer Awareness Month, but also 
garlic planting month. So it works out perfectly. And um, you really don't need to water it a lot. And um, that actually is why most people are very successful at growing garlic. So you plant it in October and then you harvest it in July. And when you look at a bulb, um, usually the bulb will have between five to seven cloves, something like that. Each clove is actually a seed. So you'll take that clove as your seed and you'll kind of put it into the ground about three inches down and then um, about six inches apart is how you space them. And then that's about it. You kind of wait until um, the next year and there's a few things you need to do. Um, if, you, if you're growing our garlic, you're gonna have garlic scapes that you're gonna want to trim off in June. Other than that, um, you can go ahead and um, harvest it in July and you can grow your own medicinal garden right there, super easy. And I touched on this briefly earlier, the garlic breath uh, cancer care kit. Like I said, I'm not selling you anything. Uh, we don't have anything, but just to, just to get it to your awareness, it, it's just that important that um, people consider garlic as a way to supplement their health. Um, you know, always check with your doctor, always let them know what's going on, but um, don't discount food. Food is um, and has been for a very long time the, the primary medicine that us, you know, humans were using. So, and I said, you know, what can you do right now to take action? You know, if you can go to the store and, uh, and find some organic garlic and, and take that, that's great. If you could even plant that, um, sometimes the soft neck garlic from the store will struggle a little bit based on our, our weather, but it is possible to grow it in the Midwest. So go ahead and give it a try. And um, if you guys ever have any questions, you know, we are um, just an email away. Um, there's a, a slide on our, um, we got a Facebook, Instagram, mm. or Garlic Breath, and then um, you can find us at garlicbreathfarm.com. And um, it's got our email on there. And just a reminder, if everyone had garlic breath, no one would be offended. That's our slogan. So that's it. I don't know if anybody has any questions. Thank you so much, uh, Sharon. Your presentation was very informative. I am personally a garlicaholic. I love garlic. Um, my, my brother's a dentist, and every time I go there, he's like, oh no, here she comes again. <laughs> garlic in the face. <laughs> but um, I have never eaten the cloves, and I never knew about waiting 15 minutes. So just wait, here I come. They're going to smell me a mile away. Is there something to help prevent the, um, the, uh, the garlic breath? Garlic breath, yes. <laughs> I didn't know how to say that correctly. <laughs> no problem. Yeah, so a um, couple of the, uh, the best ways to prevent the garlic breath. Um, well, number one, let me just say brushing your teeth is not going to work. Um, but you can do a raw potato. And sometimes, um, and this is one of the tricks of why I combined it with the, uh, the peanut butter and then also with the apple, is a raw apple will also help to combat the, the garlic breath smell. So potato, raw potato, raw apple, and then of course parsley always works really, really well. Great. Somebody actually did tell me that about apples after they smelt my garlic breath. So it must work and it must be out there. Uh, a few questions we do have for you. Uh, you may have touched on this, but it's always good to repeat. Um, they want to know, are supplements beneficial and garlic powder? Is that also beneficial? And yeah. does yeah. ginger decrease any of the benefits of garlic? Mm -hmm. Uh, so let me start with the ginger and I can tell you that um, I am not aware of any studies that show that it decreases the, the benefits of, of garlic and really everything that I try to base my information on is based on existing studies. Um, so to my knowledge, it has not been put to the test yet. So, and then as far as the garlic powder and um, supplements, you know, it really depends on what's, what's included with them. Um, a lot of powders have additives in them. Um, the powders we sell, and again, we're sold out, 
Um, but one of the reasons we're sold out is because we don't, we don't add anything. It's a hundred percent garlic. There's no additives, no preservatives. And, um, you know, we're very anti-chemical and, um, and so that really works for a lot of people's bodies. So, uh, will it have as much allicin as a, a fresh clove of garlic? No, but it will definitely be a whole lot higher than if you were to cook the garlic. So. We, uh, I have seen studies where it's actually retained um, quite a bit of it. So that's, that's worked out well. And then the supplements, it really depends on, you know, who's making them and, and what's in there. So, but I would put that in the, the same category as the powders. Okay. So question in regards to waiting for 15 minutes. Uh, should wait 15 minutes. What if it's longer than 15 minutes? Does the efficacy drop after a certain amount of time? Indeed it does. So it does the whole peak thing. And so 15 minutes is up here. And then if you kind of forget about it and leave it on the counter and then get back to it like half an hour later, yes, it does decline. Now, are you still gonna probably be better off than if you had uh, boiled it? Yeah, yeah. So go ahead and consume it. Okay. Uh, I know you did touch on how many cloves per day, but we do have a question on that again. So I just want to confirm it. Sure, absolutely. So um, I always encourage people, especially um, just the general population, uh, regular people, at least try to do uh, one clove of day, a clove a day, just for your health. Now, if you're actively um, trying to prevent cancer or or fight cancer, um, then up to three cloves a day. Now, garlic is a natural blood thinner, so you have to really be careful, and you need to be in lockstep with your doctor. You really do. Um, you know, there, there may be some other medications that it conflicts with. So um, just be transparent, let them know what you're trying to do. And a lot of times they're very supportive. They, they love that you're using natural things and um, trying to take a more holistic approach. And as long as you're also doing what they say, there's usually no issue. I agree. And uh, when you do go to the doctor, a lot of times they'll ask you your medication. So definitely just use, just say garlic. I'm taking three cloves of garlic a day or a garlic supplement. That should always be posted as a medication for sure. Absolutely. Yes. Because like I said, if you are on blood thinners, they'll probably tell you, don't take that much. It's not safe. <laughs> right. Exactly. Um, and how much garlic can be harmful? Any studies on that? I've not seen any studies, but I can tell you, um, based on um, dealing with doctors in regards to uh, blood issues, anything over three cloves um, can potentially thin out your blood too much. And since we do all respond to things differently, um, I don't know, you know how, how terrible the scenario could get, um, but uh, I, really, I, would, I would really just discourage anyone from going beyond that. Thank you. Also, uh, there is a discrepancy in the size of cloves. So I know I've grown it myself also. Some of the garlic, uh, the, is the whole thing called a head? Correct. Yeah, the whole okay. thing is it's a head or a bulb, and then the little pieces are cloves. Okay, so uh, there's a big difference in some of the heads and the cloves in comparison to others. So what is a normal size of a clove? Absolutely, perfect. Um, three grams. Uh, one one, one clove, clove. Yep, is three grams. And that, that is what it would be if you were to look up its nutrition facts. Great, so can you compare that in, I know you can't show us that right now, but what would you compare the size of a three gram clove to? Maybe a sewing bobbin? Uh, Ooh, good question. Um, so I would say, um, what are those things called? Uh, around Halloween time, they've got like those little, like uh, bubble gum things, you know, with the little twisty things on the side. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So that's, that's, I don't even remember. Perfect. I don't, know if I don't eat that, but around that, around that side, like piece of candy, kind of. All right. That's, that's a good example. Last question. Um, what if you get indigestion from garlic? Mm, yeah, good question. So indigestion, I would say you might want to start playing around with the foods that you have um, before or after it and work with your doctor on that because some people are able to navigate a way around it 
and some people just can't. Um, some people just respond to garlic in a very um, different way, a very unique way. And um, so, but don't give up, you know, try it, try mixing it maybe with some mashed potatoes, something like that. Try to try to figure out how to get it in a way that your body is going to uh, not object to. Garlic mashed potatoes can't be better. <laughs> also, um, they would like to know if you have a store in Elburn and please write down your information so people can contact you in the chat box. Sure, absolutely. Um, we don't have a store. Uh, we typically do farmers markets and then we work out of our um, out of our website and the farmers markets are done for the season. Um, we, we went ahead and, uh, and ended them recently. And um, my husband just put the, um, the website as well as the, um, our email in the chat. So everybody feel free to reach out to us. And uh, if anybody's up to the challenge of growing your own garlic, um, again, this is the time and we are more than happy to help you grow your own garlic empire. Thank you so much, Sharon, and good luck with everything. And we wish you all the best. Thank you and so thank much. you so much for presenting to this wonderful program. Thank you, everyone. All right, thank you. And now I believe Lindsay is going to come back on and speak about uh, the wonderful things that Gilda's Club is doing. Hi, everyone. What a wonderful night with so many great speakers. Thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, just want to remind everybody about a few things that Gilda's Club offers. Um, we do offer, you know, part of our healthy lifestyle workshops include lots of different fitness classes. So we offer yoga six days a week. Some days it's twice a day, sometimes it's even three times a day. And we also offer meditation and Tai Chi, Zumba, um, something called brain fitness as well, as well as a boot camp. Um, and then we also offer our educational lectures. We offer both weekly and monthly support groups. So definitely check out our website at gildasclubchicago.org. And I am going to share a slide as well. We have, I'd love to invite everybody on this Friday virtually on Zoom from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. We have something called World of Caring Day. So that is going to be... Let me see, I just want to share this slide. All right. Um, so I just, World of Caring, we are going to have um, an aromatherapy workshop, some meditation, and it's really all about, you know, self-care and caring for yourself during this time. So. Um, we also will have a presentation called Feel More Like You in conjunction with Walgreens, as well as performances by the Lyric Opera. So I hope you can sign up directly on our website and you will be sent the link, uh, the Zoom link, just like it, it was for this evening. So if anybody would love to join us, we would love to have you on Friday. We also, and then if you have any um, kiddos in your family or any grandkids. We also have a Halloween Noogie Fest on Saturday. Um, so unless anybody has anything to add, I just want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. It was a really wonderful evening and I know we all wish that we could have done this in person, but I think this was pretty great to be able to do this on Zoom. Thank you so much to Susan Latosha and Pat Patrice Stevens from Advocate Christ Medical Center for allowing Gildas Club Chicago to be a, a part of this tonight. And thank you, Gildas. It's great being partners with you and we hope to continue more of these in the future. And we hope to invite all of you again to join us in the future. Yes, thank, thank you. you all so much. Patrice, go ahead and speak up. This is all your program. <laughs> well, for our 15th year, who knew we'd be doing it this way? But I'm just so very, very excited that it's been such a great success. And thank you. Our speakers were all wonderful. So um, again, um, thank you. And let's hope uh, 
2021 in October, we'll be meeting together in person. But um, boy, I'm just, uh, I have to thank Susan and Lindsay and of course all our speakers for um, helping um, just be able to pull this off. I mean, it was amazing. It really was amazing. So thank you everyone. Thank you all and to all a good night. <laughs> yeah.